We come this morning, brothers and sisters, to look at the cherubim. We want to pick up one more feature before we jump into the narrative of um, chapters 8 through 11, and that is the issue of being full of eyes. It comes up in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 12, their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, their wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. So here we have a picture of a multitudinous group. It's not one eye, but there are many eyes, and they're all over their bodies, over their wings, their hands, their backs. They are completely covered with them, and so are the wheels. And brothers and sisters, this is an idea of what God wants us to be like. He wants us to be full of eyes. And so if we are to be part of this cherubim to manifest the same characteristics, we need to understand this symbol. It is, of course, one that perhaps isn't that difficult. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 tells us that the eyes of our understanding should be enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory and of his inheritance in his saints. And so this idea then of being full of eyes is the idea of enlightenment through the word of God. We think of the words of Psalm 18. Psalm 18, we read there, that the statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. And this is an idea, brothers and sisters, that is expressed throughout Scripture. These cherubim, they have healthy eyes. They have the eyes of Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, where we read, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be healthy, as the original has it, the whole body shall be full of light. So the entire cherubim, in their plurality, are full of light. These are those who enlightened, whose eyes wait upon Yahweh until that he have mercy upon us. And so we have to have our eyes fixed upon our God. These are those, brothers and sisters, who have anointed their eyes at the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 3, in the letters to the Ecclesias, and at verse 18, he tells us, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And so that is the blessing to our community of Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Fit in between the drying up of the Euphrates and that great day of God Almighty, the battle of Armageddon, we are specifically told, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So we see the idea of watching, being full of eyes, is tied very closely to the idea of keeping garments, knowing the return of the Lord is nigh, and living accordingly. And so, brethren and sisters, the admonition of the Apostle Paul we looked at the other day, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Watching, brothers and sisters, sobers us. Because when we see the nations of the world aligning themselves according to the pattern of God, we know the day approaches. And so that is the invitation, of course, of the cherubim, as we will see tomorrow, of Ezekiel, or sorry, of um, Revelation chapter 6. He saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and he heard, as it were, the voice or the noise of thunder, and one of the four living creatures inviting him to. Come and see, verse 1. Verse 3, come and see. Verse 5, come and see. Verse 7, come and see. This is the invitation six times to come and see as it's laid out throughout that section. And so, brothers and sisters, this is the role of the cherubim. They are to be the watchers. They are to be the watchmen, and this is what the Lord, of course, said to Ezekiel himself. In Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning. Having eyes isn't just the idea of sitting back and watching. It's reporting what is seen. Give them warning from me to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to these things, it's because there's no light in them. 
And so that is the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain and are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. And so we must translate our watching into the care of the house. We must have the wings as well of the cherubim. We must have that protective measure that we bring around our families and our ecclesias, that we take them under the care of the wings of the Lord. We are told to be full of eyes, though, brothers and sisters. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. So watching is the antidote to temptation, or one of them. The other, of course, is prayer. It must be tied with prayer because we are treasure that is in earthen vessels. And we need to be found watching when our Lord comes. We read in Luke chapter 12, verse 37, Blessed are those servants who the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. And he tells us that he will have fellowship with us. Nobody is exempt from this, brothers and sisters. It is the whole of the cherubim. Their whole body, backs, hands, wings, wheels, full of eyes. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 13, he says, what I say unto you, I say to all, watch. Not one of us is exempt from this. In fact, it was the virtuous woman that we read of in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 27, who looketh, she watcheth for her house. She is not idle. Well, brothers and sisters, this is a vision that must motivate us to action. We read in Habakkuk chapter 2 the idea that Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. It's not just a case of sitting back as couch potatoes or armchair warriors reading these things and looking at them. We must be engaged in this vision. We have to be motivated to run, to whirl, to revolve in newness of life. And this is what the cherubim are doing. The living creatures, they run and they return as the appearance of a flash of lightning. And so we must be doing that, being motivated by vision. As you read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, for his vision, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down on the right hand of the throne of the deity. And of course, it is following in the footsteps of Abraham, who was called to go out and obeyed, and he went out because he looked for a city. He was a watcher, looking forward to the things of the kingdom of God. And so, brothers and sisters, we have the lesson of the eyes. The cherubim are indeed full of eyes, the eyes of their understanding are enlightened by the word of God. Their whole bodies were to be full of eyes. No member was to be exempt. They are the children of light who watched, obeying the invitation of the Lord to come and see. They, their watching served as an antidote to apostasy and temptation. They continued in this role and are found watching until the Lord returns. And the wheels, being full of eyes, tells us that they are revolving based on what they see. Their watching motivates them to action, and they run when they read the vision. But there is also a warning, brothers and sisters, tied in with this. The Word of God is alive and powerful. It is the sword of Eden as well. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And neither is there any creature that is not made manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He is a watcher too, brothers and sisters, and he sees what we do. He walks amongst the candlesticks and f is fully cognizant of what is going on in our lives. And so the warning, brothers and sisters, that is associated with this is one we should take to heart. And it's really demonstrated in Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11. So just pulling these pieces together, and unfortunately this is not in your notes, so if you want to catch this summary, you're going to have to write it down. The cherubim are a symbol, a depiction of the community of believers who have come out of great tribulation. They are Yahweh's chariots, the vehicles of his will. They are the custodians of the, or the keepers of the way of the tree of life. They are the holders of divine truth. 
They are a community of believers, a multitudinous body who represent the majesty of the deity. They are God manifest in the flesh. They are kings and priests, or will be. They have the face of the lion, the future ruling class of the kingdom, which roar out the prophecies of Yahweh. They are the sons of God, his firstborn, symbolized by the man. They are the sons of God because they are led by the Spirit of God. They follow their head, Christ, whithersoever he goeth. They are God's servants, the ox, the laborer as vehicles of his will to bring about his purpose. They are lifted up from among, uh, from among men to divine heights by the Spirit, soaring as the eagle, the Word of God lifting them up from among mankind. They manifest the protective character of Yahweh, sheltering their families, their ecclesias, and the ecclesial world under their wings. They carry the Word out, of the world, out to the world around them on divine wings. They have hands that hold forth the Word of life. They carry it to those who would respond and bring them back to Yahweh on their wings, bringing them under the wings of the covenant, as we read with Ruth. They are walking uprightly with straight feet, turning neither to the right hand or to the left, but following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. They walk, they move, they revolve in newness of life, they have wheels of beryl, they are the jewels of Yahweh's crown, the treasured people, because they show forth the characteristics of him who called them out of darkness. They are constantly in motion, constrained by the love of Christ, having the same thoughts of Isaiah of, here am I, send me. They are watchers, enlightened by the word. They warn the community as watchmen. They have accepted the invitation to come and see and reap the benefits of seeing those things which are shortly come to come to pass. Thus, they keep their garments and walk in white. They are the future judges of the world who will go out from the ancient of days and take the kingdom and establish the kingdom, establishing God's purpose on earth and filling it with his glory. Yahweh, the King of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, he who will be the Savior, is enthroned above them. He is pleased to inhabit them. His God is pleased to inhabit them. His characteristics, which he has showed to us, we also are to carry. He communicates with mortal flesh through them. Well, brothers and sisters, Israel was Yahweh's cherubim. They were a vehicle of his will, the ecclesia called out, Clesis and Ek, out of Egypt to manifest his name, and they will be once again the future cherubim. We are supposed to be God's cherubim now, called out of the world to manifest his name and be vehicles of his will if we hope to be part of the cherubim in the future. Having this picture in our minds then, brothers and sisters, let us return to Ezekiel and to his vision. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 8. Chapter 1 was the introduction to the cherubim where it's given to us in all its detail. But in chapter 8 to 11, he is in vision with this creature. Understanding this characteristics that we've gone through over the last few days, right from Eden through the law and into Isaiah, Ezekiel, we now come back to look at the narrative, and we'd like to walk through with Ezekiel on this journey. There is a storyline that's given in Ezekiel chapter 8 through 11, and quite often when we're looking at the cherubim, we don't look at it in its context. We look at just the, the signs and the symbols. We'd like to spend some time, though, considering the vision Ezekiel was taken into. Again, think of it like a play. There are characters who come on and off of the stage. They interact one with another. There is a narrative that takes place. So let's enter into this vision with Ezekiel and see what is to take place. We find Ezekiel in the beginning in chapter 1, or chapter 8, sorry, and verse 1. We read, It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, that I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, and the hand of Yahweh fell upon me there. So here he is amongst his brothers and sisters in captivity. And the hand of Yahweh falls upon him. It describes this angelic visitor of a frightening countenance who comes to him in the vision. 
He says, I beheld and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins even downward, fire. From the appearance of his loins upward, fire. It's a brightness, brothers and sisters. It is the color of amber, which of course is the color of the whirlwind out of which the cherubim come. And this creature, this amazing manifestation that Ezekiel sees, this terrifying thing, puts his hand forth, the form of a an hand, and takes him by the lock of his head and transports him between this, the earth and the heaven. He is now in vision. He is carried up by God in vision to Jerusalem to see what is taking place. And so we come to Jerusalem with Ezekiel, and we read that he brought me into the visions of God, in the visions of God, to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner court, and it looked toward the north. So he is taken to Jerusalem and removed to the door of the inner court in the temple of God. And he looks towards the north. Now this is the temple of Solomon's time. This is where Ezekiel is. This isn't the future temple of the latter chapters. He is in the time of Solomon's temple, the temple still existing. And so, brothers and sisters, as he is taken there, we find that with him, in this vision, the glory of God of Israel was there, according to the vision I saw in the plain. The cherubim of chapter 1 are in this vision, representing God's dwelling with man. And what he sees, brothers and sisters, are some terrible things. The state of Israel and their spirituality. There are three or four transgressions, you think of Amos, that are laid out. He's brought, first of all, to the door. And he sees here at the door, the inner gate, that is, that looketh towards the north, the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh jealousy. This was an image, this was an idol, which provoked God to jealousy. He had told him, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But here was an idol that had been brought into the house of God, an idol that provoked God to je jealousy. Now as we follow Ezekiel, brothers and sisters, through this narrative, we need to examine ourselves. These things were written aforetime for our learning, upon whom the end of the world is come. We need to use the eyes of the watchers to look and see what happened there and examine our own lives and see what difference is there between them. Taking the prayer of the brave, as it sometimes is called, in Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, know my heart and try me. Know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And so we ask, brothers and sisters, what are the images, the idols in our lives that provoke our God to jealousy? Of course, we live in a very materialistic age, and we're told that covetousness is idolatry. What are the things that we covet? What are the things that stand between us and the kingdom of God? As we move along with Ezekiel, he is taken in chapters 8 and verse 7, and he's brought to the door of the court, and when he looked, behold, a hole in the door, and he's told to dig through the door. He's now brought into the private lives of the ecclesia in Jerusalem. What's behind the wall, brothers and sisters, of our private lives? We read in verse 10, I went and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. He enters in and sees the glimpses of the flickering lamp, and against the wall, the idols of Israel portrayed against the wall. We have to ask ourselves, if Ezekiel were to dig through the walls of our lives, what are the images that he would see portrayed in our houses, flickering in our homes? Would they be abominable? What are the images that we look at in private, in the dark? What flickers on the television set when no other brothers and sisters are around? Brethren, what flickers on the computer screen? Do we have hinds feet walking uprightly? Are we the watchers of the word? 
or are we the watchers of the world? What would our grandparents think even if they could see what is displayed in the privacy of our own homes? We come, brothers and sisters, to Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 11. We find here the elders, the 70 of them, of the house of Israel, and Jazaniah, the black sheep of Shaphan's family, is there. And every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense goes up. They're religious, brothers and sisters. Kid yourselves not. They have censers. They have prayers that they're offering out. There are clouds ascending. All the trappings are there. But who else has had censers that we've considered this week? Isaiah? Think of the men of Korah, Dath, and Abiram's time. Think of Hophni and Phinehas. What about ourselves? Are we just simply going through the motions of religion? Do we have our own senses as they have here? Or do we have God's will being done in our lives? Or as has our worship simply become what we would like to do and not what the Almighty requires of us? In verse 12 we read, He said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, Yahweh seeth us not, Yahweh hath forsaken the earth. That is the mindset, brothers and sisters, of the apostasy in Israel at the time. God doesn't see us. They're in the dark. Their eyes are no longer enlightened. They are in darkness. And they think that God can't see them. They think that Yahweh has forsaken the earth. That's the mindset warned about in Luke by the Lord Jesus Christ when he says of those servants who are not looking for his return, who say, our Lord delayeth his coming. He goes on to say about the situation, Hast thou seen, O son of man, the thing that, is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. The result of this idolatry is violence. They've lost the uprightness of the feet, the protective attitude of the wings towards their brothers and sisters. They are no longer holy as he is holy. That also parallels with Luke, doesn't it? My Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink with the drunken. And the Lord of that servant will come and cut him in sunder. What about ourselves, brothers and sisters, as a community? Do we descend into this mindset? Are we hostile in attitude to our brothers and sisters? Who cares what they think? Are we treating them roughly with violence? If we have, then we have become Israel of Ezekiel's day. We have become the same as that of Christ's day, a body without the spirit that is dead, ripe for judgment. He comes to the third abomination in chapter 8 and verse 14, to the door of Yahweh's house. And he finds there the women weeping for Tammuz, it's Baal. These are the sisters of the Jerusalem Ecclesia, weeping for their idol. This is the husband of Ishtar or Ashtaroth. He was the sun god that died in the winter only to be restored before the new year. And their idol, brothers and sisters, if we note, is blocking the way. And again, what are the idols that we have blocking our way to the kingdom, sisters? What consumes us every day? Is it the decorating of the living room or the new bathroom? The furniture, the color of the paint? Do we spend our bulk of time running around shopping, our wheels turning very quickly, going hither and yon, consumed perhaps with our careers? It's very easy for all of us just to become wrapped up in the world. What about the teaching of our children? Do we take a role in establishing readings, perhaps when father is away at an A-B meeting or a class? Do we do the readings with our children? Do we bring them under the wings of Yahweh? Do we bring them under that covenant of truth? Are we doing the God's, or our God's will as the cherubim, or is it our own will that we are performing? Verse 16, he now comes to see the brethren of the Jerusalem Ecclesia. He brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house, and behold, the door of the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar, there are about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of Yahweh and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. About 25. How many are there in the vision of Revelation that are on thrones surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ? There are 24. 
This is about 25. Where do we want to be, brothers and sisters? This is the question we must ask. And this, brothers and sisters, is the height of it. They have their backs towards the temple of Yahweh and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun. Do we, brethren, turn our backs upon the ecclesias in our daily lives, chasing our own desires, turn our backs upon the Bible readings because we need our time, I must go to the gym and I must have my time, not doing the readings with our children, being the heads of our houses, bringing them under Yahweh's wings and teaching them to walk uprightly in His ways. Do we turn our backs on the Bible class? Too many important things to do. The meeting at work, the conference I must attend. Do we turn our backs on our meetings? There's just too much to do around the house. The lawn must be mowed, the leaves must be raked, the pool must be fixed. When we are in the temple courts, brothers and sisters, are we looking towards our God? Or are we looking every other direction and talking about cars and sports and jobs and the latest little gadget? We all, brothers and sisters, can follow the pattern of Israel at this time. And we must ask ourselves the question, are we cherubim, or have we become like the children of Israel at this time, the ecclesia in Jerusalem? It's a frightening thought when we consider what happens next. Chapter 9, just over the page, we come here in verse 2, six men come from the way of the higher gate. There are six of them, the number of the wings of the seraphim, the creatures of judgment. The gate that lies towards the north, every man with a slaughter weapon in his hand, and every man among them was clothed with linen, and the writer's, or sorry, among them was one man clothed with linen, and he has a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and they stood beside the brazen altar. And these, brothers and sisters, are the issues of life, are they not? What has our worship become? Our God will soon separate out and find that out. What are our purposes? What are we doing? Because here we have men with swords, with slaughter weapons. Those who protect the way to the tree of life on the other side of the coin. During this scene, an important event takes place. During the whole event, the cherubim have been in the courtyard of the house on the right side with the glory of God over above them. They have stood there, and yet we read the glory of the God of Israel has gone up from them. It's gone up from the cherub where he was, and it stands now on the threshold of the house. What does that mean to us, brothers and sisters? The flaming sword now guards the way to the tree of life. These people will no longer be allowed to enter in, because the glory of God has moved to the threshold of house, the place of judgment, and the cherubic sword is now keeping apostate Israel out. Well, brothers and sisters, what goes on next? We read that there is a separation of the remnant of the ecclesia that is carried out. Yahweh said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. He is to go and separate out those who are weeping not for Tammuz, but now who are weeping for the state of affairs in their ecclesias. Those who have been opposed to the synagogue of Satan, the church within the ecclesia, those who have been trying to preserve the word of truth. But take note, brothers and sisters, what happens next. He says to the others, in his hearing, go after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old, young, maids, little children, women, and come not near on any man upon whom is the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. It's worthy of doing some self-examination, brothers and sisters, because here is the reality. If the children are sanctified by the parents, and the parents are rejected, where are the children? Where were Dathan and Abiram's children when judgment was meted out? 
Where were Achan's children when judgment was meted out? Where were the children of Israel in AD 70? Where were the little ones when judgment was meted out? They had provoked Yahweh to anger. They had forsaken him. His people were destroyed for lack of knowledge because he had rejected, they had rejected listening to him. He says, I have rejected you and your children and you shall be no priest before me. Well, brothers and sisters, the same process goes on in the book of Revelation. We find there the angels of Revelation are about sealing the servants of God in their foreheads and judgment was not to go on until they were sealed. And the same group is found on Mount Zion in Revelation 14 verse 1 with the Lamb. And they've got their Father's name written in their foreheads. They are God manifest in the flesh. If we want to be part of this group of the saints, the called out ones, then we have to be part of the remnant of the sealed of the ecclesia that Ezekiel saw. And we should make every effort to ensure that that seal is upon us and upon our children, brothers and sisters. Ezekiel is absolutely devastated by what he sees. These are his people, his brethren and sisters. Shaphan's son, no doubt he knew. Shaphan's family was a godly family, and here is the black sheep. He would have been grieved at this. It's a frightening proposition, and he begs God. He turns around and he says, Ah, Lord Yahweh, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel in pouring out of thy fury upon, uh, upon Jerusalem? But brothers and sisters, the door at this point in time was shut. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. And so the angels go out. And God says the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. The land is full of blood, the city full of perverseness. For they say, Yahweh hath forsaken the earth, and Yahweh seeth us not. But as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. Those who were destined for destruction thought that God couldn't see them. They had gone the way of Cain and sold their birthright for a bowl of stew. What will we sell ours for, brothers and sisters? Or will we hold on to it above all else? You see, we face a similar prospect, pending judgment. And while we quibble about, perhaps on the fringes, who may or may not be there, perhaps we should be spending a little bit more time preparing for the day of judgment, brothers and sisters. Because we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Bible school is a time of contemplation. So let's look at ourselves, never mind everybody else. Let's look at ourselves and ask, what stands between me and the kingdom of God? What stands between my family and the kingdom of God? And let's remove those idols between us and God's kingdom now. Where is our focus? Are we focused upon the temple? Are we focused upon the kingdom to come, or are we focused everywhere else? The words of Isaiah, brothers and sisters, are a time-limited issue. Seek ye Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, his way. And let him return unto the Lord. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There is opportunity, brothers and sisters, but we must seize it. And so he tells them, he says, go and slay utterly. He goes on to tell them, brothers and sisters, at this point in time, to not spare. The man with the writer's inkhorn is told to begin at my sanctuary. Will it be any different for us, brothers and sisters? What does Peter tell us? The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly appear? 
Nevertheless, brothers and sisters, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The angel returns, or the man with the writer's inkhorn, and says, it is done. I have done. The same words of Revelation 16, 17, which are soon to be uttered. And we then witness, brothers and sisters, a very tragic thing in many ways. But we have to get this idea into our heads. God's will is going to be done on this earth, with or without us. We can either be part of the cherubim, we can either join in with him, we can manifest him in the flesh, or we can be part of the world and be carried away like those who were slain in Ezekiel's vision. We read in chapter 10, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So Ezekiel then sees the vision, brothers and sisters, above the cherubim of the throne. And this is actually where chapter 10 comes into the picture of the narrative of Ezekiel's vision. It begins now. And so we see here, brothers and sisters, if you turn over to chapter 10, Ezekiel has a similar vision to Isaiah, except Isaiah saw the completion of the glory of the Lord filling the earth. Ezekiel sees the time when the cherubim of Israel was about to, to, to depart. The man with the writer's inkhorn in chapter 10 verse 2 is told to go in between the wheels and even under the cherubim, fill thine hands with coals of fire from between the cherubims and scatter them over the city. What have the seraphim done? Taken a coal and touched it to Isaiah's lips. As with the cherubim, brothers and sisters, there are dual characteristics. We can be either healed by the coal or we can be destroyed and burned by it. It's our choice. Either we put the flesh to death now or it will be put to death in the future. It's the simple story of the Bible. It is the atonement. Put it to death in our lives. Live unto God. Become the vehicles of his will. And so fiery judgment is about to be poured out over the city God exhibits both mercy and truth and errs on the side of mercy. But when the time has come and the iniquity is full, then it's time, brothers and sisters, for judgment. And so we find this site where the cherubim stood on the right side of the house. And when the man went in, the cloud filled the inner court. Here we have the similar picture, going back to Solomon's time, going back to the tabernacle. But it's a time of great distress, brothers and sisters, because the glory of Yahweh then positions itself to depart. The glory of Yahweh went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of Yahweh's glory. His will will be done upon this earth, brothers and sisters. And one of the cherubs stretches forth his hands from between the, the uh, cherubs and gives the fire to the man. And he goes and he takes it out and he's told to scatter it over the city. Tragically, judgment is about to fall upon this city. And the glory of God can no longer reside in this place. And so we read, brothers and sisters, that the time had come for things to change. The glory of God could no longer be here. And in verse 18, we read that the glory of Yahweh departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. One of the most tragic scenes in Israel's history. And in verse 19, the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And they went out, by the, went out, the wheels also beside them. Every one stood at the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. So here we see, brothers and sisters, the cherubim as they, they basically prepare to depart. God can no longer inhabit this nation. He can no longer be there in this time. It's the time when the glory of the God of Israel departs. When the king is told to take off the diadem, remove the crown, thou shalt not any more be king. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it him. And so we read, brothers and sisters, that these cherubim lift up their wings 
and they leave the city. They go over to that gate, first of all, and then we read the cherubim did lift up their wings and the wheels beside them. The glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. The mountain, of course, on the east side of the city is the Mount of Olives. And some 600 years later, the greater manifestation of God's glory would leave the city in the same way, going to the Mount of Olives, and from there being taken away in a cloud, departing from the city to the Mount of Olives. And from there, of course, he ascended up into heaven. And Ezekiel, brothers and sisters, is brought back in this vision. Afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to them of the captivity. So the vision that I have seen went up from me. Then spake I unto them, the word, or unto them of the captivity, all the things that Yahweh had showed me. And so Ezekiel, brothers and sisters, is returned to the place where he began, and the burning one departs, and he tells them everything that he has seen. He recounts to them the vision. He is the voice of the cherub to them who tells them the story. Brothers and sisters, what a humbling vision. These things, although they might be uncomfortable, are written for our learning, for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world is come. There is no time for political correctness and niceties. The Lord is at the door. We see the hand of God moving the nations to establish his will, setting the stage, preparing the table for the great day of the God Almighty. The Lord, brothers and sisters, is about to knock upon the door, and we all, like Ezekiel, will be taken away. We will be removed. The Lord himself shall descend from the heavens with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be taken together with them to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. And that is our hope, brothers and sisters, that we will consider in our last class tomorrow. To be with the Lord Jesus Christ as we enter the visions of the book of Revelation. It's a humbling vision we have considered. It's a vision perhaps that has made us think a little bit this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ says... Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Become part of that cherubim. If we've lost our way, if we've forgotten what manner of people we ought to be, brothers and sisters, let us rekindle that fire of the truth within our family lives. Or else, he says, I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent.